Now, today is the 24th of October, which is interesting because 89 years ago to the very day was when the panic selling began on the US stock markets that became the Great Crash of 1929. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index went on to fall 90% over the next three years. And if we think about why that was, it was primarily due to human behavior. The focus is always on the big crash, the downward movement more so. But it's just as important to understand why did prices get so high in the first place that they could fall so far? And the answer comes down to human behavior. And from the perspective of goals-based investing, you could say that people who made investments around that time at the peak had their goals thoroughly destroyed. The market didn't regain its previous highs until 25 years later. So our point is that it's critically important to understand how and why people are making decisions, the mistakes people make, uh, and that way you can avoid making the mistakes yourself and even uh, potentially take advantage of mistakes where you see them being made by others. So this is all about human behavior, behavioral finance. And the human being is, as this slide says, one smart primate. The most intelligent life uh, form on earth, at least in some ways, and in terms of engineering, for example, able to build amazing structures almost a kilometer into the sky. But equally, the human being is capable of extremely foolish behavior, as um, this example shows, this gentleman riding his motorbike with his barbecue wrapped around him on Melbourne's Eastern Freeway some years ago. And when it comes to the realm of investing, the same applies. Incredibly bright minds are put to work in the field of investing, and those same incredibly bright minds can make incredibly foolish mistakes. So why does this matter to advisors in terms of dealing with their clients? Well, one reason is that of the many um, areas that advisors can add value, managing investor behavior, their client's investment behavior, is a potentially a huge source of value added. As the little diagram on the left shows, drawn by Carl Richards, the American advisor, and he simplifies the point um, by saying, we buy when we're greedy, um, we sell when we're fearful, and we're, if given enough rope, we'll repeat until we're broke, or at least until we've severely impaired capital. The evidence for that is on the right-hand side, courtesy of the Dalbar study, which shows the return of the US market, annualized return over 20 years at around 8%, and the actual achieved investor return in funds aiming to track that index of um, between four and 5%. So a huge amount of value destroyed. Importantly, the black bar is based on buy and sell points. So we see value destroyed by people buying high and selling low. The other reason it's important is that human behavior is an enduring feature. That means it's not a short-term anomaly that's going to disappear suddenly. It's persisted for centuries and it will continue to do so. And so for those investors who are focused on this, um, is potentially a huge source or an edge, an advantage in investing to take advantage of. So we've given a few examples over the centuries there, one from each century, um, which many of you will be familiar with, and if not, they're well worth researching. Um, but the point is, these, these human behaviors have persisted over centuries and will continue to, to do so. Human beings evolve very slowly. Um, interestingly, if we look at where we are now, you can see um, 2018. Um, here's the S&P 500 index. As we all hear, we're, it's been the longest bull market in history for the US market, and it is now reaching extremely high levels. So where to from here, and how do you deal with this? What does this mean from a behavioral perspective? So firstly, why does this behavior persist? Why do humans continue to behave in this way, and why are those mistakes likely to be made again and again? Um, well, one reason is the way that people think, uh, the cognitive function of the human brain, how people perceive things, how they make decisions about what to do, um, remains the same. And a good model of that um, is this, are you McCoy or Spock? So James Montier, the well-known behavioral investor, coined uh, the idea of um, likening this to the Star Trek characters, McCoy, the hot-blooded human who shoots from the hip first and asks questions later, and Spock, the logical uh, cold calculated Vulcan. This is based on the X and C system, the model brought up by Matthew Lieberman. Um, the X system, the X relates to the X in reflexive, so automatic knee jerk 
type reactions. So automated behavior based on shortcut thinking versus the C system, which is reflective, thoughtful, logical, step-by-step -step type behavior. Um, and so most people would like to think that they make decisions thoughtfully and carefully, but a lot of our um, behavior and decision-making is based on the X system. So even important functions like driving your car will have a lot of the X system in them. Many people will be familiar with the idea of um, having been driving for a while and suddenly realize what have I been thinking about something I've been driving. And that works because what you perceive and see when you're driving is largely reality and your automatic side can adjust to that and deal with it. When it comes to investing, however, what you see and feel is often um, confusing and counterintuitive and can lead you to make the wrong decisions. Whereas the C system, logical and thoughtful, is much more um, black and white and requires careful thought and it's more time consuming and onerous. So for example, if brushing your teeth is your X system, if I said to you multiply 34 by 27, that requires your C system. Um, Likely, people who bought Bitcoin back in December 2017 at nearly $20,000 um, were being driven by their X system, which said this thing has run up a lot and it's likely to continue to do so. So be wary of the X system. Um, it's better to use your C system when you're investing. One way to look at this and to, uh, something to use with your clients potentially is the cognitive reflection test. So this was devised by Shane Frederick. Um, it's intended to force people and encourage people to use their X system. It gives them enough information to make shortcut um, conclusions. We won't go through these uh, in, the, in the interest of time, but if you run through this with uh, your clients or yourself, first of all, you'll find that for each of these questions, there's a more seemingly obvious wrong answer and a less obvious correct answer. Um, and this was conducted, it was run across 3,500 people. 33% of those people got none of these questions correct. 17% um, only got all of them correct. And I've run this test on data group um, PD, PD sessions for advisors and the, the portions are about the same, the, the results are about the same. So it's something that may be useful for conducting on your clients. The more questions people get wrong, the more susceptible they are to behavioral biases. How do these behaviors appear in financial markets? <clears throat> we'll just use a couple of behavioral uh, finance terms here to give a couple of examples. All of these really um, behavioral errors go back to people all tending to behave the same way at the same time and make the same mistakes. Overconfidence is the illusion of control um, where an investor considers too small a range of outcomes. For example, if the news on a particular share or the market is broadly positive and everything looks great, then they may say the outcome may be more or less but it's probably going to be positive rather than considering a neutral or even a negative outcome. We recognize mistakes in others more readily than ourselves. A good example of that is if you ask 100 people who here is a better than average driver, more than half the people will typically say they are and that can't be the case. And the experts are often more the most overconfident. A couple of examples of that on the left, we see the quote, stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. That was the well-known over bullish quote by Irving Fisher, who was a renowned economist in 1929 and an advisor to several investment trusts. So he certainly was responsible for allocating capital. And after he uttered those words, the market fell 90% as I talked about and didn't recoup its highs in, until 25 years later. Um, much more recently in 99, um, almost the peak of the tech boom, three separate books were written by separate authors, Dow 36,000, 40,000 and 100,000, each outbidding the, the prior. Of those books, two of them were written by two separate um, economic advisors to presidential candidates, so presumably well-credentialed people who laid out their thesis as to why this would happen. But really they were working, they were providing C system arguments for X system thinking, which essentially was driven by what has happened in the recent past, and I think that's likely to continue. So errors are made by experts too. Recency bias, as it sounds, is where investors simply look at the recent past and extrapolate it into the future. And here we've shown the share price of Newcrest Mining in red and the composite of analyst sell side recommendations on the stock is the, is the dark gray line. And we can see it broadly tracks the share price up and down, particularly when a trend kicks in. So the majority of um, sell side analysts were re recommending this stock around $40 and recommending to sell it at around $8. And this is one way to destroy capital. So what does Alan Gray know? Well, we know that arrogance is the kiss of death in investing. We know that we don't know everything. And we know 
therefore that we must focus on only the few things that we think we can do reliably well. And those are essentially valuing companies, recognizing when people are offering to sell us them cheaply and being patient in between. Um, here's an example of contrarian investing, which is the approach we follow. Some people think it's uh, a more uh, worrisome or risky approach. We take the exact opposite view. We believe it's a risk aversive approach. The whole intention behind contrarian investing is you don't pile into something that's popular, facing huge amounts of competition to buy the stock which is being bid up. Rather, we sit back and wait for it to become cheaper and less popular and buy it more cheaply when we're facing no competition. It's just not easy to do. So here we show again the share price of Newcrest. We've stuck with that stock. At the peak of the market, there was good news written up in the Australian, 2010. In 2013, the news was rather more negative. Um, around that time, we started to acquire the stock, um, which is the dark gray area, which shows how many shares we owned. Um, we didn't just buy because the price had fallen. We think that would be incredibly stupid. We require um, ourselves to have conducted our own fundamental valuation on the company and believe the company is going to exist long into the future before we buy. We have to know our own assessment of value so that we know whether we're over or underpaying. Um, and then if we do know the value and there's some negative sentiment around the stock, that's typically what gives us the opportunity to buy significantly cheaper than our assessment of value. This sort of approach can pay off over time. Um, here I've just given two, two examples, our fully invested Allen Gray Australia Equity Fund, and at the other end of the spectrum, our most conservative fund, the Australia Stable Fund. I've shown the returns for each over seven years. It's not arbitrary, that's just how long the Stable Fund has been running, and there's no point showing the return for two different time periods. So you can contrast the equity fund with the stable fund over the same time period, 14% versus 7%. The equity fund should be higher return over time. Um, it's also a more volatile and more risky fund. It's fully invested. The stable fund can hold lots of cash, up to 100% cash. An important point here is that the equity fund, even though it's been fully invested, has outperformed the ASX 300 index 62% of the time in down markets. So we have outperformed more in down markets than we have in up markets and by a greater amount on average. The stable fund has also outperformed uh, significantly more in down markets and almost none of the time in up markets. It holds lots of cash as you'd expect, but that fund offers a little more downside protection. Key point is that both funds seek to value companies based on fundamentals, buy them when they're cheap because the prices are depressed due to negative sentiment and then wait patiently. The stable fund also takes a step further in assessing um, in an absolute sense, the attractiveness of those stocks versus cash and, and makes a balance between that. Just on buying at depressed prices here's an, and stepping away from Alan Gray, here's an extreme case study. This looks at that period of the great crash of 1929. So the black line starts at the absolute peak of the market in September 1929 and says, um, if you'd bought then, here's you have track the, the broad share market down. And it went from over 30 to slightly below five, a fall of almost 90%. So it would have felt much more comfortable and convenient and easy to buy here at the peak of the market, where the red circle is, because the news was all positive. Everyone was optimistic and bullish. Um, if you had bought there, your five-year annualized return would have been negative 22% per annum over the next five years. If you've had the patience and the stomach to, to wait, and more importantly, the stomach to buy after the market had fallen significantly, probably by about 70%, you could have bought here where the yellow circle is, and from here you would have made a 10% per annum return over the next five years, although you would have had to wear further downside in the interim. If you'd been blind lucky enough to buy here, you would have had a 27% per annum return over the next five years. That would have been luck. The key point is that to earn a decent return, you need to buy somewhere at the lower end where prices are depressed. You can't get that in advance, obviously, but those prices typically only come when the news is not um, hugely positive. In fact, it's typically the opposite. So you need to be able to buy in the face of negativity and against the consensus, which is within that um, dotted box there. So moving on from that, investing with a difference today, where are we? Here, this is Alan Gray's view anyway. We see the market is still not being cheap. The, this is the ASX 300 index. The black line is the price index of all the top 300 stocks. 
The gray thin line is the earnings of those stocks multiplied by 10 so that you can see it on the same scale. The red line is dividends on the same basis and the gray shaded area is the book value of all those stocks. So in a simple sense, the black line, the distance between the black line and the other three things tells you how much you're paying for those fundamental measures of value. So what we can see, and I'm sorry, all of those are adjusted for inflation, which is why the lines are not steeper. So what you can see is you're, you're paying, for example, a fairly wider multiple of earnings versus history. And those earnings are not depressed earnings. They're probably on trend or probably marginally high even. Um, and so we think the market is expensive. Uh, certainly it's not cheap. The whole point of this though is that you don't need to buy the aggregates, which is our whole reason for being. Within there, there are companies that are crazily expensive and there are companies that should be um, reasonably cheap. So as we talked about buying into shares when the prices are depressed, there are some things that have done well over the last five years and some things that have done poorly. Um, where we've started to buy in, um, more recently is in the uh, telecommunications area. We've been buying into Telstra specifically. We don't buy sectors, we don't buy industries, we buy individual companies, having valued those individual companies. We think that's uh, significantly discounted to value when we started to buy in. For a longer period of time, as this graph would suggest, um, energy companies have been depressed. And going back some time, we started to buy into Woodside Petroleum and or Origin Energy, and we've added more on weakness. And as those things have run, we've trimmed a bit on strength, but we still think that they're fundamentally cheap. On the other hand, the broad market um, is, is up there in the dark gray line. Financials feel as though they've come off a bit lately, but in the scheme of this, they'd still be way up there above the, uh, the 100 line. So we don't think those are cheap yet. Certainly not the banks in any case. Where we do hold financials, for example, is in QBE, which has been significantly depressed over a little while now. We've bought into that company also. Um, aside from our fully invested fund, our stable fund, as I mentioned, will hold cash. So in addition to buying the cheapest stocks you can find, um, you can also, as I said, take an absolute view and say, how attractive are those stocks versus cash at this point in time? What this uh, fund does is as the market rises, and the market is shown in the, bl the black line there is the ASX 300 index. As the market rises, we will shy away from shares and move into cash. So you see the gray area falls, that's our exposure to shares, and our cash exposure rises, and vice versa. So we're counter cyclical, we'll buy when things are cheap and we'll shy away when they're expensive. It's a more conservative fund. So in summary, we said that behavioral errors lead to investing mistakes. People make mistakes investing, lots of them, and they'll continue to do so because human behavior does not change. That means it's a great way to take advantage of persistent features in financial markets. You just need to have the stomach and the willingness to do that. Recognizing those mistakes is the first step in dealing with them, the first step in not making them yourself or for your clients, and also the first step in taking advantage of them when other people make them. We've discussed the practical solutions that can provide an advantage, focusing on valuation. Don't buy anything unless you have a good sense of what it's worth, and then don't buy it until you can buy it at a significant discount to what it's worth. And that typically arises where people are using their X system and they're selling you the thing cheaply. And we've just discussed some of our current views in terms of what we own currently and how we see the market. So with that, Matthew, I'll wrap up, and perhaps we can hand over to Dalton. Excellent, thanks very much, Julian.